I'm Rick Gregory. I'm a native of Adams, Tennessee, and this is the heart of where the Knight Rider era took place. And I'm going to talk to you for the next few minutes about the Knight Riders. Now, before I start, just a couple or three things. One, this isn't a story about good people and bad people. This is a story about people who found themselves in an incredibly bad economic situation and each individual family had to decide how they were going to respond. Secondly, some terms. Uh, those that belong to the association, and I'll talk about it in a bit, often called those people that did not join hillbillies. That's not the origin of the term hillbilly. They called them hillbillies. Now those who decided not to join the Tobacco Association we're getting ready to talk about, they called themselves independents. So I'll use those terms in, in the story. And a third thing that I would say to you is that it's very hard to understand why the people did the things they did, why they turned to violence, why some people joined and some people didn't, unless you understand that tobacco is an incredibly labor-intensive crop. It's a crop that requires a whole lot of hard work. Very little of it could be done then and now with machinery. And when you're housing tobacco, for example, you're standing on tear poles, one on top of the other, and the sweat of the person on top of you is falling onto you, and your sweat's falling on who's, who's beneath you. And I think that creates a bond to do that kind of hard work together. And I think we've got to grasp that to understand, again, why folks did some of the things they did over 100 years ago. And the, the Knight Rider era that came out of the early 1900s is the largest area, largest time of mass violence in American history from the Civil War into the Civil Rights Movement. Now to get all this started, we've got to go back to 1890. In 1890, a man named James B. Duke put together the American Tobacco Association. Now what he had in mind was to put together a monopoly in tobacco very similar to what Carnegie had done in steel and Rockefeller had done in oil. And that is, he wanted to control the, cro the crop from the time it was planted until the time somebody bought the product. So he wanted to control both the raw material and the product going out to consumers out there. And he was able to do it. By about 1900, Almost all the tobacco in the United States was controlled by the American Tobacco Company, Duke's Trust. And that's what quite often it was called at the time, Duke's Trust or the Trust. And either the Duke Trust or Duke had put together some combinations, some agreements with the Italian Regie who bought tobacco for most of the European market and a couple of other smaller companies that they would not compete with each other. So that meant basically by 1900, if you were in Robertson County, Tennessee, where we are right now, or the other counties of the Black Patch, that's another term I need to describe to you. Dark fire tobacco is often called black tobacco, and the area that grew this kind of tobacco was very small. Robertson County, Montgomery County, the Tennessee counties bordering Kentucky over the Mississippi River, and then if you drew a straight line up from where we are to the Ohio River, just follow those Kentucky counties down the river. Just a handful of counties in the United States grew dark fired tobacco. Now, Duke's Tobacco Trust. By 1900, if you were going to sell tobacco in the Black Patch, you had to either sell to Duke or, or the Italian Regie or one of these other small companies. And if you didn't sell to the first buyer that came out to buy your tobacco, nobody else was going to come. They had a monopoly. And since they had a monopoly, that meant that farmers in this part of the world were raising tobacco for less money than it cost them to raise it. So they're going in, in debt every year. In 1905, 1906, that time period, it cost about six, seven cents a pound to raise a crop of tobacco. But by 1900, tobacco is selling for what farmers call three, two, one, and a cussing. 
tobacco is graded and the top grade would sell for three cents, the middle grade two cents, the lugs, the bottom grade one cent, they called it three, two, one in a cussing. They're going in debt every year raising tobacco. Duke's getting the money. And so a lot of farmers, again, starting right here in Robertson County, under the leadership of Charles and Joel Fort, who lived over on the other side of Adams, and Felix Ewing, who lived in Cedar Hill, about five miles from here, they got together with some other smaller farmers, and they decided that if Duke had a trust of buyers, they needed to put together a trust of suppliers, of, of farmers. And so they formed in 1900 the Robertson County Dark Fire Tobacco Association. And then pretty soon other counties raising dark fire tobacco did the same thing. Now what they had in mind was if we hold our crop off the market long enough, they have to raise prices because they can only get dark fire tobacco from us. They can get other kinds of tobacco from other parts of the country, but only we raise dark fire tobacco. So they're driving us into bankruptcy. If we hold our crops off the market, they've got to raise the prices. Now, as you might guess, the problem is if you're in Robertson County and you've got a tobacco association and you're holding your crop off the market, the other counties are selling theirs. So you're holding yours off, they're selling theirs. That might be good for them because the less tobacco on the market, the higher their price is going to be, but it's not helping you. So Robertson County and some of the other early counties who started holding their crops off the market got with folks in the other counties and they formed in 1904 in September the Dark Fired Planters Protective Association. Now, all the counties that raised dark fire tobacco joined it. The idea was that all of us would hold our crops off the market and force Duke to raise the price of dark fire tobacco. Now as you might guess, the big problem for the Tobacco Association from here on out, I'll just call it the association. The problem for the association would be those farmers who chose not to join. Again, hillbillies in the eyes of the association members, independents in, the fo in their eyes of themselves. So, in 1905, at Stainback Schoolhouse, which is not far from where we sit right now in Adams, Tennessee, Understand, a church and a schoolhouse at, at, in early 1900s would have been the social centers, not just religious centers, education centers. They'd be the social centers of a community, and staying back schoolhouse was one of those. And so a group of farmers from Robertson County met the staying back schoolhouse, and they formed what they called the Possum Hunters Association and passed the staying back resolutions. They called themselves Possum Hunters because Possum Hunters hunted at night. And what they were going to do, they were going to do at night. And the, the Stainback Resolution said, among other things, that in groups of no less than five and no more than 2,000, that they were going to visit farmers that did not join the Tobacco Association and reason with them. That's a real nice way of saying they were going to use intimidation to force people to join the association. So they started doing that. And before long, many people that probably were on the fence were joining the association. Some still held out and did not join. And when those that did not join refused, no matter how many times people talked to them to join, then farmers in Robertson County and other parts of the Black Patch turned to violence. In the beginning, it would be nothing more than uh, burning somebody's barn, which was a huge thing. I said nothing more. That was a major thing to burn somebody's barn or scrape somebody's plant beds or uh, whip somebody, hurt somebody who did not join. And as the, night, as the night riding era progressed and more and more violence broke out in the black patch, it worked. And that's a, that's a moral conundrum for a lot of folks because we're taught not to turn to violence but the violence did work in this case. And most people ended up joining. And at the height of the Knight Rider era, the Knight Riders not only visited individual farmers, the Knight Riders would raid towns. They raided Hopkinsville, Kentucky, they raided Russellville, Kentucky, and they raided uh, Princeton, Kentucky. Took over the towns, burned what they wanted to burn, beat who they wanted to beat, and intimidated who they wanted to intimidate, and left. 
Now, the leader of the Knight Rider organization, he never admitted that he was, but the leader of the Knight Rider organization was a medical doctor. And his name was Dr. David Amos, and he lived at Cobb, Kentucky, which is right outside Princeton in Cowell County, Kentucky. And it was an organization formed on military lines with people at every level of, of the organization in charge up to who we would call the general. That would be, that would be Dr. Amos. Every, every county was divided into districts and every district had a Knight Rider group. And the Knight Rider group in this area was stationed out of Cedar Hill, Adams, and Sadlersville. And I know who those folks are. I'm not gonna tell you who they are because uh, some of the folks who let me know was their ancestors are still alive and they ask that I not reveal those names until they're no longer with us. But I know who were the major members of the Knight Rider group in this area. And I found out, by the way, because there's a federal court case against the Knight Riders in this area. And right there listed in the federal court case are all their names. And some of them live fairly close to where we're sitting right now. So that, that mass violence worked and the town that did not get, or I guess, I guess I should say city, that did not get raided was Clarksville. Now the Knight Riders always wanted to raid Clarksville because Clarksville was the home of the American Tobacco Company in this part of the world. That's where most of the independent tobacco was raised. They never raised Clarksville because of geography. Think about those of you that know Clarksville, it, Clarksville was, was formed where Red River, which is just right behind us right here, Red River ran into the Cumberland River. And so the only way to get into Clarksville coming from this side was to go through bridges. So the problem for the Knight Riders wasn't that they couldn't get in and, and burn things in Clarksville. The problem was they couldn't get out. All that they would have to do, those in Clarksville that wanted to fight the Knight Riders, all they had to do was block the bridges and they would have them pinned in Clarksville. And Clarksville, by the way, had a militia. They formed a private militia to guard against the Knight Riders. And the head of the militia was a man, again, right here from Robertson County. The head of the, the militia in Clarksville who guarded every night against a Knight Rider raid was Ben Sorry. Ben Sorry had been sheriff of Robertson County at the beginning of the Knight Rider era, was burned out. He had a tobacco warehouse here, was burned out, and so he went to Clarksville. He helped form the militia, and he would send letters, by the way. He'd send letters to the Knight Rider groups or to the members of the heads of the association saying, why'd you raid Princeton for? Why'd you go to Hopkinsville for? Clarksville's where you want to raid. Come to Clarksville. We'll show you a good time. Well, the, they always, the Knight Riders always wanted to raid Clarksville if they were smart enough not to, because they knew that the, with the bridges they might not be able to get out. A group of folks in Montgomery County, by the way, killed some Knight Riders not far from us in Sango, which is right up the road here. Uh, the, that group of Knight Riders had been going to Port Royal, which is just right down the road here, going to Port Royal to raid it and decided not to and they were turned around and they were headed back home to Sango when a, a group of the, the militia from M Montgomery County uh, waylaid them and killed, shot several and killed one of the men. And the man's buried there in Sango today. Now, a good story about the, the raid on Hopkinsville. That was the biggest raid that the, the Knight Riders did. Now, Hopkinsville, besides for Clarksville, was the major American tobacco company stronghold. And that was an area where a lot of independent farmers lived. And they sold their tobacco in Hopkinsville through the American Tobacco Company, not through the, the Tobacco Association. And a good story that came out of that was the fellow who was mayor of, of Hopkinsville. Also, he was editor of the newspaper wrote a lot of scathing editorials in the Hopkinsville newspaper about the Knight Riders. And they showed up at night. He was one they wanted to find and whip. Well, he snuck out the back door and snuck down an alley and went down the coal chute and hid in the Baptist church, even though he was a Methodist. And after that, the Baptist in, uh, in Hopkinsville would say, see, that shows you the Baptist did at least save one person. And so 
Uh, that's just one of dozens of stories about the Knight Rider era, about with individuals. I'm going to tell you a story about a woman. So, if the if the Knight Riding era created a situation where a lot of people did end up joining out of fear, and that helped raise tobacco prices because all the tobacco that was being held off the market forced Duke to do that very thing to raise prices. So, what ended the Knight Rider era? So, first of all, prosperity. Farmers are historically individual. They historically don't like to band together. They're very independent. And as soon as prices went up, a lot of farmers started saying, well, we've got what we wanted. Instead of three, two, one, and a cussing, now tobacco, by old 1908 or so, nine, tobacco selling for eight, nine, 10 cents a pound. We got what we wanted. And so a lot of farmers started pulling out of the association. But a couple of other things killed the Knight Rider era. And one was a woman, and her name was Mary Lou Hollowell. She lived up in, in Kentucky in Callaway County. And Mary Lou was a very independent woman for her time, very outspoken woman. Her husband was rather mousy. And Mary Lou ran a boarding house and she would say as, as she waited on people in the boarding house, she'd badmouth the night riders. And her, her husband would say, and some other people came to her and said, you can't be doing this. You can't be, you can't be uh, uh, bad-mouthing night riders. They'll come visit you. And she said, let them come. I don't care. Well, one night they did. They came to her house. And one of the night riders was her husband's brother. Something to grasp. In the night rider era, it wasn't maybe one section of the, country, of the county against another section or one county against another county. It was family against family, church against church. A lot of churches in this area had to have two services every Sunday, one for independence and one for those who belong to the association. So here's a brother coming with a Knight Rider group to whip his own brother and his own brother's wife. And so they did, they whipped Mary Lou and they whipped her husband, Robert, and they said, you need to leave. You need to get out of here. And Robert said, we're leaving. Mary Lou said, I'm not gonna let anybody scare me off. I'm gonna do something about this. And so she went to a lawyer in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and said, what do I do here? Because you could not win a court case against night riders in county court. Because in any county, there'd be night riders on the, the jury or people would be afraid of the night riders on the jury so they wouldn't find against night riders. And so the lawyer, name was, was John Miller, he said, what we'll do is you do leave. leave the, not only leave the county, leave the state. And when you leave the state, sue the night riders. Now, it won't be a criminal case. Criminal case, the state would have to be suing the night riders or the county would. Sue them as a civil suit because they burned your property and they hurt you personally. So move out of state, sue the Knight Riders in a, in a civil suit, and when you do that, it has to be in federal court. Federal court was in Louisville. So they could get a, a jury in Louisville that didn't have Knight Riders on it and people who weren't afraid of the Knight Riders. That was well away from here, and it worked. Uh, Mary Lou sued the Knight Riders in civil court, uh, federal court in Louisville, won a large uh, monetary reward against the Knight Riders. And for several years after that, because most of these Knight Riders that were sued did not have all the money to pay, so she let them pay every time they sold their tobacco crop. So a saying would go like this. One of the ex-Knight Riders would see another one and say, what are you doing? He'd say, raising tobacco for Mary Lou. It took several years to pay off that debt. The same thing happened in other areas. When Mary Lou set the standard, in a lot of other areas, including Robertson County, people started doing the same thing that had been raided by the Knight Riders, especially people that had been whipped or hurt by the Knight Riders that move out of Tennessee, out of Kentucky, sue in civil court and, and federal court. And the final thing that ended the Knight Rider era was 1914, the beginning of World War I. Now, mo I haven't mentioned this to you before, but most dark fire tobacco is not used in the United States. Dark fire tobacco is one of the strongest and one of the highest nicotine tobaccos raised in the world. And it's too strong for most Americans. Uh, we still use 
Dark Fire Tobacco today in, in Copenhagen and in Skoll and chewing tobaccos. And I think it's kind of funny and I see young men, they think that they're really, they're really macho because they got a big quid inside of their mouth. You know, they got, they got, they, they're, they got chewing tobacco in their mouth. That makes them a man. I go, oh, shh, my grandmothers did that. So uh, then and now, the tobacco we raise quite often go in plug tobacco and what now we call skull uh, and the, the, the snuff. And, but most tobacco is exported, was then, is now. The Europeans particularly like stronger tobacco, especially the French. So the war starts, the Germans put blockades on British ports and French ports, the French and the British put blockades on German ports, so our tobacco can't get to Europe. And since we can't get our tobacco to Europe, the finally in 1914, 1915, the, the leaders of the Tobacco Association got together and said, why should we ask people to sell through us when we can't find places to sell tobacco? So they released everybody from their pledges and shut their doors. Now after World War I, there was an attempt to get the Tobacco Association started back again, but it never really worked. And then also in the 1920s, a tobacco association out of Louisville called the Shapiro Association tried to do the same thing, but it never could get traction in this part of the world. But in the 1930s during the Depression, when the federal government is trying to figure out how to end poverty in agricultural areas in the country, when they looked at tobacco, they came to this part of the world and realized what our tobacco association did here in forcing farmers to keep their crops off the market and raise prices. This became, that idea became the base of the AAA, the, the AAA programs of the early 1930s to help raise the price of tobacco in this part of the world and cotton and other areas did the same thing. So what our people did in 1900 became the base of a federal program in the 1930s. To give you an idea of how quickly the Tobacco Association grew and how important it became, within a year after it was formed, we have a big meeting in Guthrie, Kentucky. 5,000 people show up. Now think about 5,000 people in an area where Robertson County probably didn't have 10,000 people itself. Now folks came from other counties as well. That was an incredible number of people to come to Guthrie. Now I probably need to mention why Guthrie, Kentucky became the center of the sale houses for the Tobacco Association. Railroads. At the time we're talking about almost all goods moved in and out of this part of the world on railroads and since most dark fired tobacco was exported, it was exported out of New York City. And so the tobacco that was raised here and in the Black Patch went by railroad to New York City. That's why Guthrie was so important. It's, it's a rail center for this whole part of the world. But think about 5,000 people showing up in Guthrie, Kentucky. Perfect. And by the way, you hear that train? I believe that train is there. You hear that train? We're close to Guthrie, that's why. Hearing that train, that's why Guthrie, Kentucky. And so 5,000 people coming into a little town that just had a few hundred people it was a mass meeting. And there was, large, there was large meetings every year where people would come, they would bring their families, there'd be plenty to eat. The leaders of the association would speak and give an idea of where they were in selling the tobacco crop for that year. It was just a big time for folks in this whole part of the world. Now before railroads, by the way, I said Red River's right behind us. That's how tobacco got to market. But rather than New York, it was New Orleans. Almost any kind of product in this part of the world, where there would be any kind of agricultural product, would go on flat boats. People would get together, families would get together, they'd build flat boats and they'd wait all oh, about February, March, when there's when you have a lot of rain, there's a lot of water in Silver Fork, Red River, Buzzard Creek, all the little creeks that feed into the red, they would put in that float down to the Red River, it float to the red of the Cumberland, and eventually the Mississippi, all the way down the Mississippi to New Orleans, and then walk back up to Natchez Trace. Coming of the railroads, this part of the world would be about the time of the Civil War. 
we went from the rivers being the main transportation arteries to the railroads. So, the trial in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. The, the most of, with the exception of the Mary Lou Hollowell trial, the trial that was most important where people were suing Knight Riders was because of the raid on Hopkinsville. And for me as an historian, what made this trial so important was so much, because the Knight Rider organization was very private. Nobody ever admitted they were a Knight Rider. Matter of fact, when you became a Knight Rider, you took a blood oath that if in fact you divulged information about the Knight Rider organization, that those that were in your group were supposed to kill you. So people would not talk about it. And so a whole lot of information came out at the trial up until that time we did not know about. So the raid took place on, uh, on Hopkinsville and they decided to have a trial and bring David Amos and other people that they believed to be Knight Riders. So held a big trial in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. And that was the first time, the first time that in an open uh, criminal court trial, names were listed out there. And Amos uh, was, was, that's when we first found out that Amos was head of the Knight Rider organization. He was wounded at, the, at Hopkinsville as well, by the way, and did not, not bad enough to kill him, but he was wounded. Lived several more years, and a great irony, by the way, is that he died of lung cancer, and he always had some kind of tobacco in his mouth. He smoked and he chewed, and he died of lung cancer, which might well have come from tobacco. Another great irony Another great irony about Amos and James B. Duke, the American Tobacco Company, was James B. Duke, when he got older, and like a whole lot of people who probably made a lot of their money in ways that they probably should not have made it, maybe got to thinking about the next world, and he decided that he wanted to do something good. And so he decided he was gonna leave a lot of his fortune to Trinity College. Trinity College in North Carolina. But he put a stipulation on it that, if, that he would leave all this money to Trinity College if the college would change its name. What would you reckon he changed, wanted the name changed to? Duke. So Duke University, the great basketball power, one of the great universities in the United States, was originally Trinity College, became Duke, named after James B. Duke, who was from North Carolina himself. And another great irony there Duke University started a medical school and one of the first graduates of the medical school at Duke University was Dr. Amos's son. So the very man who spent a, several years of his life fighting James B. Duke, his son becomes one of the first graduates of the medical school started at Duke University. I think also something that folks watching this might want to do. David Alford, who the son of Adams, Tennessee, is a local playwright, actor. He's also on the television show Nashville. Wrote a play for us at Community Spirit. That's a group of us in this part of the world who come together to help put on plays about the history of this part of the, of, put on plays about the history of Robertson County in this part of the world. David wrote two plays for us, one called Spirit, which is about the Bell Witch, and the second one called Smoke about the Night Riders. And so I would suggest to you sometime in October, come see us here in Adams, Tennessee and see David Alford's piece called Smoke. I think it's the best piece ever written about the Night Riders. It also, by the way, is a musical. Some of you watching this are probably thinking, how could something about the Night Riders be a musical? Well, a genius like David Alford made that happen. It's a, it's a superb piece.